We don't want to do those things that are going to cause offense to others needlessly. It's good neither to eat meat nor drink wine or do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. He's saying, listen, I know I have liberties here. Paul's saying this. But it's better for me just to deny myself rather than to cause my brother to stumble or to, to offend his conscience, to make him weak, to, to give him a reason, you know, to sin. It's not worth it to me. I will set aside my liberty. I will deny my right in order to love my brother. Amen? You know, this may come as a real shock to you, but we actually have differences in the body of Christ. I know. I know you're shocked. We don't all agree on the same thing. Did you know that? We actually have different opinions. I know mean, it's surprising. Maybe It's not surprising, however, if you're married, because you get that, right? <laughs> you don't always agree on everything, do you? Uh, but the thing is, is that the amazing thing is, is that God desires that we find unity. But he knows we're not going to find unity anywhere else ultimately than in Jesus Christ. You know, that's why it is so important for us to worship him. We come together. We come together corporately. We set him as Lord of our hearts. We open our hearts to hear from him. And he sort of settles things for us. You know, he prayed, Father, make them one as you and I are one. That's always God's heart. But getting there is not easy. It's just not easy because we come at life from so many different perspectives. And then, you know, there are the things that God has given to us in his word that are sort of black and white. This, you know, there are certain things that are clearly universally wrong. There are things that are clearly universally right. But then there are a lot of other things that God doesn't actually specifically speak to it. And then he relies, he wants us to rely upon our conscience, upon the Holy Spirit, upon the word of God. And, and he wants us to make decisions about, okay, what's right for me in this? What's wrong for me in this? And where we draw those lines is different for different people. And so what we talked about as, we, as Paul started this chapter uh, in chapter 14 the first part was just dealing with the Christian liberty that we have. Now, I don't, know, I don't know about you, but I, for one, am so glad that I don't live under the old covenant. Can you, amen? Can, can I get an amen? Can you imagine living under 613 commandments and every single time you sinned and broke one of them, you know, you look at your lamb and they're like, no, no, not me. That guy over there, you know? And, and you have to go and make a sacrifice every single time you sin. I mean, this would have been difficult to live under that old covenant. And of course it was, and that's why the Jews didn't do it. They fell short. And that's why Peter, when they were trying to figure out what laws do we put on from the old covenant onto the Gentiles that are getting saved. And, and Peter said, listen, don't put this yoke of slavery and bondage on them that we ne neither we nor our fathers could bear it. And so we're under a new covenant. Amen. And that covenant is that Jesus has fulfilled the law for us. He didn't abolish the law. He fulfilled it for us. So that by believing in Jesus Christ, we may have the righteousness of Christ credited to our account. And that's what Paul has talked about throughout the book of Romans. But then with that, there's just these places that we have differences. And so there are those people that have liberties that you don't have. There are people that have convictions you don't have. And so how do we all get along in this sort of an environment? And, and as I said, last Sunday, Paul looked, we kind of looked at the law of liberty that we have in Christ. But even as we looked at last week, just because we have liberty doesn't mean we do this in a vacuum. It doesn't mean that we do it in such a way that it's going to cause harm to our brother and sister that maybe has different convictions than we do about things. And so we need to be aware of the people around us. And that brings us to the second half of this chapter, which is the law of love. The law of love. You know, when you don't know what to do, just say, what would love dictate here? Okay. That if you, and you're not going to go too far wrong, right? Because Paul already said that all of the law that God gave can be summed up in this commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. 
So that's what we're going to look at today. We're going to look at four principles that Paul gives to us concerning the law of love. The first principle is that we need to learn to walk in love, to walk in love. Verse 13 of chapter 14 says, Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. So, first of all, he says, okay, he's been talking about this. He's, don't judge the other person. Now, that's not easy because judging the other person is the thing that comes most naturally for us, okay? Uh, if, but he's saying, listen, you, if you're going to judge... Judge this. Judge yourself. Judge yourself. And the way you're going to judge yourself is that you're going to judge yourself. Am I walking in love? And, and or am I putting a stumbling block before somebody else? Now, how could you do that? Well, the way you could do that is if something that is a liberty to you is an offense to the conscience of someone else. And it could cause them to stumble over what they see in you. Or even worse, say, you know, you, it's okay for you to have a glass of wine, maybe. And this person over here is a recovering alcoholic. They can't touch this stuff. And now they are emboldened to go ahead and take a drink. And then they stumble and fall. And you brought that about just by your example. So those are kinds of things that we have to be aware of. We have to be operating in love. And the bottom line is, if you're just thinking about yourself and you're not thinking about the people around you, you probably are in sin, okay? (laughs) Because that's the root of selfishness. But we need to be circumspect. We need to be careful about the people around us. And, you know, we've had like these wintry days here on Sundays. You you would never think, you know, as somebody's coming up the sidewalk, ooh, I'm just going to really ice this sidewalk. So when they fall, they get on it, they're going to slip and fall. <laughs> you know, that would be evil, okay? You don't stick a stumbling block in front of, you don't try to trip your brother. And this is what he's saying. You got to walk in love, which means you aim not to trip somebody up. And, and so that's the first thing. Then he says, I know, and I'm convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean in of itself. Now, now, Paul's probably speaking here primarily of foods. Because, of course, there was all kinds of dietary restrictions under the Old Covenant. He grew up as a good Jew boy, you know, didn't uh, eat non-kosher food, didn't eat pork. Uh, everything had to be prepared a certain way, didn't eat his oysters, whatever. <laughs> uh, and... You know, but as he came under the new covenant, he was convinced in the Lord. There's nothing inherently that's unclean here in the foods. But he said, uh, to him who considers it to be unclean, to him it is unclean. And so he understood here that, that he could be strong in his faith. He could understand that, you know, I could partake of this. I, I believe Paul being around Gentiles probably had an occasional pork chop, you know, and he was okay with that, you know, uh, certainly probably bacon. I mean, who can resist that? Right. Um, I don't know if he had a bacon and maple bar, but you know, if he, he, he tried it, he probably would have loved it, you know, but at any rate, his point is, is that, but, you know, going into many Jewish synagogues where there were lots of Jews that they were very, much attentive to the dietary restrictions. Is it kosher? Is it not kosher? You know, he probably didn't say, here, have a slab of ham, buddy. You know, he wouldn't have done that because he knew that for that person, that that would be unclean. And so that's the, the whole concept here. And it applies to so many different things, not just food, not just wine, not just, you know, the days that we mentioned, like what day of the week do you celebrate uh, the, you know, like, do you celebrate Sabbath or not? All of those things that can, people have, can, can have different convictions about. You know, th- these are all things that, that apply in this area, this arena of having liberty between you and the Lord, but also being circumspect and not doing something that's going to stumble somebody else. And so that's the whole thing. Verse 15 says, now, if your brother is grieved because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. 
Do not destroy with your food the one whom Christ died. So the whole thing is this walk in love, care about the other person. Now, if you consider just the way the Lord looks at all of us, okay? You know, he went to the cross to die for our sins. He loves us so much that he was willing to do that, to lay his life down so that we could be forgiven, so that we could have, you know, peace with God and, and be with God forever, okay? And, and so God is working in all of us this work of salvation. And if something that I would do would cause somebody to like be offended, you know, maybe like they see me do something and then it's like, oh man, I can't believe that person did that, you know? And then maybe now they don't want to come back to this church. And, and maybe, and I, what I have found is a lot of times when people see somebody that offends them or, or they get offended by somebody in the church, not only do they not want to go back to that church, they just drop out of church altogether. And so, and so this work that God is doing in them can be sabotaged by us if we're not carefully judging ourselves in these matters, you see. And, and so we don't want to destroy the person uh, for whom Christ died. Now, and I'm not here to say, are they eternally lost or whatever? I, I'm not making that choice. The, but the bottom line here is that you can mess somebody up in their walk with God by you doing something that is offensive to them. And rather than dealing with it as a mature Christian, which would be to go to you and say, hey, you know, you offended me, which is what I wish all Christians would do. But a lot of them don't. They just say, well, you know, I can't believe this. So I'm not going back to that church anymore. Blah, 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 blah. You know, and then they just don't go to church. I'm not going to church. There's a bunch of hypocrites in the church. It's like, well, one more won't hurt. So come on and join us. You know, so that's what I say. You know, so. <laughs> and we're all under construction here. We're all sinners saved by grace. We're all, un, you know, we're all just casualties that Jesus just said, you know, I, I care about this person. I'm going to bind him up and do something with him. Amen? So welcome to the group. <laughs> well, he said, therefore, do not let your good be spoken of as evil. Okay, so what he's talking about here is, you know, he said, hey, I, I know it's clean. I'm good with this. If you're good with, with eating this or whatever, partaking in this thing, it's right between you and the Lord. You can say, God, thank you for this. You know, that's fine. But don't let your good be spoken of as evil. Well, how would that happen? By, by doing it before somebody that's going to say, oh man, can you believe this? You know, it's like, and now they're speaking evil as something that is good between you and God. You, know, you have the freedom to do this. You have the freedom. But now it's spoken of as evil. Why? Because you did it in front of this person and gave them the opportunity now to speak evil of it. It wasn't evil before, but now it's being spoken of as evil, even though it's your good. See what I'm saying? So that's what he's saying. Be wise about this. Don't give them that opportunity. Uh, you know, and then, you, then you'd be troubled by it. Before you were fine, but now that person is judging you, and now you feel troubled by it. It's like, well, it's, you shouldn't have done it before the person, you see, uh, and because you gave them that opportunity. Verse 17 says, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. Okay, so this is the second principle. First principle is walk in love. Second principle is we need to be kingdom-minded, okay? What is the kingdom of God all about anyway? Hey, the kingdom of God is that Jesus has come so that we can have eternal life. We're going to inherit an eternal kingdom. You know, Jesus said, don't be afraid, little flock. It pleases your father to give you the kingdom. So this is where we're headed. And what's it all about anyway? It's not about, you know, do I eat this food? Do I not eat this food? You know, it, these things, is this, it's not about that. Although, you know, we say we're calorie chapel. We love our potlucks. Okay, we do. We like to eat. I love to have food with other believers. Amen? Amen. It's fun. We're going to be doing that in eternity, by the way. But that's not the substance of what the kingdom of God is about. It's not about arguing over these things and having all of our opinions over these things. Some of you have the freedom to eat gluten. Okay, I'm one of those people. I like to make sourdough bread. I have great freedom. I hope I didn't stumble you. I have great freedom in the Lord to eat my gluten. 
Some of you, you know, you don't want to eat any carbs. That's okay. I get it. You know, you're trying to lose weight or whatever. So you might go out to dinner. You might go to a potluck. Somebody's got the chocolate cake out there. You don't have to eat it. But don't give stink eye to the guy that loves to have chocolate cake, okay? You know, it, it, <laughs> oh, we're hitting close to home here. In the end, the kingdom of God is not about these things, okay? I get it. Sometimes you have to not eat because of health reasons. But it, that's, this is temporal stuff here. And here's the thing, is that we're not citizens of this world. We're citizens of heaven. We're just passing through. We're just travelers on our way to heaven. So don't get caught up in all this stuff that leads to divisions so many times. When, when the Lord is calling us to peace, you know, we're, we're as members of one body of Christ, we are called to peace. So do those things that make for peace. Um, Jesus said in Matthew 6, 25, therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you'll put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? There's more to the kingdom of heaven, this eternal kingdom that God is calling us to. There's more to it than these temporal, yes. trivial kinds of things. So, you know, it's been said, the main thing is to keep the main thing, the main thing. <laughs> and what is the main thing? Well, Paul tells us, the kingdom of God is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's what it's about. God has given to us the righteousness of Christ. He knew that we could never earn it by our own good works. No one is justified by works of the law. Paul already made that point. So what does God do? God sends Jesus he fulfills the righteousness of the law. He becomes sin for us. Then God credits to our account his righteousness. But then it's not over because as it says that he who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That means that God now he saves us not for sin, but to be transformed and to live a life like Christ, to be becoming more like Christ. So, so that's the righteousness that, that we receive as, as a standing, but then God wants us to put into practice, you see. And it's both. Is it faith or is it faithfulness? Yes, <laughs> it's both. Uh, and so, uh, so, so that's part of it. Second is peace. Again, Jesus came to bring us peace with God. He settled the matter of the separation that our sins brought between us and God. We e eternally offended God by our sins. Every one of us. We've broken the commandments. And, and God has put that away. He separated us, uh, our sins from us as far as the east is from the west. He's reconciled us to himself through the cross of Jesus Christ. So that we now have peace with God. But that doesn't end there because not only do we have peace with God, we have the peace of God that is in our hearts. Isaiah 26, 3, one of my favorite verses. You will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is steadfast because he trusts in you. God wants you to walk in perfect peace. You can do that if you're just surrendering your life to him. If you realize that, hey, whatever happens, God, I know you're in control. I know you have forgiven me of my sins through the blood of Jesus I know my name's written in heaven. I've got peace with you. Now fill me with your peace. And the Lord wants us to walk in that, you see. Because that peace of Christ that is in our hearts. Jesus said, peace I leave you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, give like to you. Don't let your heart be troubled. Don't let it be fearful. That peace of Christ is the empire of our heart to help us to discern between what is right, what is wrong, what is God calling me to do, what is he not calling me to do. And so we have this peace. See, that's what we should be focusing on. Not is this particular thing, you know, right for me to eat or not. You know, let the peace of God determine that in your heart through your conscience. Amen. And then the next thing is uh, joy in the Holy Spirit. Hey, get this. The Lord saved you so that you can experience 
fullness of joy. Hey, tell your face that, okay? <laughs> God wants us to have joy. Hey, Jesus said, these things I say to you so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be full. How many of you would like the joy of the Lord? Yes, How many of you would like to have overflowing joy in your life? You see, it comes not by the circumstances. Circumstances can be terrible. It comes because you're anchored in Jesus. And you know he's going to ultimately use everything in your life for good. You know? So don't get all caught up. Don't get in a tizzy about what's going on circumstantially. Maybe you can't rejoice in the circumstances. Maybe your circumstances are downright miserable. But Jesus is still on the throne and you can rejoice in him. And the worst thing that will happen is you die and then you go to be in his presence. So, hey, hallelujah. Praise hallelujah, what I say. You know, rejoice in the Lord always. And, you know, how many, are, how many people are stopping you in the street and saying, how come you're so joyful? <laughs> what did that would happen? What did they would corner us and say, what is going on with you? You have no reason. Don't you see what's going on in the world? It's a miserable place right now. How can you be happy? You know, it's like, we ought to be saying, hey, man, I got the joy, 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 joy in my heart, right? We should be singing that, amen? I know you think I'm crazy. I am. But man, it's so much more fun to have joy in your heart than misery. Come on. So that's what God has come to bring us, you know? Righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. Now, now here's the last thing. We're in a kingdom. That speaks of a king. Yes. It's not you. Newsflash. You're not the king. I'm not the king. Jesus is the king. It's all about us serving him. Everything we do, it's about doing it for the Lord. I should be able to say whatever I'm saying, whatever I'm doing, I'm doing this for you, Jesus. I'm doing this to honor you. I'm doing this out of thanksgiving for you, for your glory, you see. We're serving Christ. If you're serving Christ, that you're serving the king, then that just shows you're a subject of the kingdom. Amen? And, that's, and if you do that, you're going to please God. You're going to please people. I mean, well, not all people. <laughs> but the ones that really matter will approve you. <laughs> because you're doing the right thing. Amen? Verse 19. Therefore... Let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. So the third principle here in, uh, in the law of love is to pursue peace and mutual edification. Now, as I said, there's just a lot of divisions in the world. If you don't re believe that, just look at the whole political arena, okay? And it, it's constant. But we have to labor. We have to pursue. That means go after it with a vengeance, okay? Peace. Because it's not natural for us. What's natural is, you know, you offend me. I'm going to not like you. I'm going to separate. I'm going to be bitter or whatever. I'm going to hold a grudge. I mean, that, that's human nature. We have to fight against that. Uh, we have to seek to preserve the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. That's what the Bible tells us in Ephesians. It's certainly what Jesus is praying for. John 17, Father, he's three times he prays. Father, I pray that they will be one as you and I are one. Okay? That doesn't happen naturally. That happens prayerfully. That, that happens understanding that there is a real devil who through all of his demonic minions are seeking to do everything he can to divide and conquer. Okay? to get us pitted against each other uh, and to bring divisions so that we do not agree in the Lord. That's Satan's work, okay? So you, we have to seek to pursue the things that make for peace and those things by which we may edify one another. That word edify, it means to build up. Hey, listen, when we get all hung up in ourselves, in our own opinions, you know what we're doing? We're tearing down. We're tearing down. There's a proverb that says the foolish woman tears down her own house with her own hands. That's terrible. 
But we can all do that. We can tear down our own house by our words, by our attitudes, you know? Now, we have a great illustration of, of what it's like to build. Right now, we took our property. There was nothing on it but weeds. <laughs> and now we have a structure. We are building. And, and that structure is one day going to have a lot of ministry going on in it, you know? We know we're the temple of God. It's us, the people. It's not the building, but still, we're building this together so that a lot of ministry can take place there. Amen? And it's one, you know, stud at a time. I'm not talking about men. I'm talking about <laughs> lumber. Uh, one, <laughs> one stud at a time. One steel girder. You know, we keep doing stuff to build this up. Why? Because we know that as we build it, it's going to be a house that brings glory to God. Amen? Well, it's the same thing is true with us. We build one another up. We edify one another. We strengthen one another, not tear each other down. Look for the good and build out of us. Anything good, anything praiseworthy, anything of good report, think on these things. But better yet, have you ever just gone face to face with somebody? Just sat up and look in their eye and say, this is what I appreciate about you. You know, you love me. You, you do my laundry, even when it's stained in various places, you know. You, you go shopping for me. You're kind to me. You love on me. You know, it, you do that with the people in your life. You validate them. You affirm their gifts, what you appreciate about them, how you're blessed by them. You cannot look at somebody in the eye and have, have a dry eye. I tell you, you can't. And do you know what that does to people? Because this world and the devil is tearing them apart. You know what that does to build relationships, to build the body of Christ, to build that person up in a way that is a healthy self-esteem? It goes very, very far. And this is what we're supposed to be dedicating ourselves to do. You know, build one another up. Do those things that lead to peace and mutual, mutual edification. That's the next part. Then he said, do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. God is building that person up. That's the bride of Christ. That is the person that has been made in the image of God. They're God's workmanship. He's building on them. You don't know what all they've been through from day one, but God is building Christ in that person. So don't destroy that over the sake of your liberties, you see? That's what he's saying. Don't destroy that person. That might mean that you have to deny yourself of a right or a liberty. Yes, it may. But you do it for the welfare of the other person. Don't get selfish. You know, I was just thinking just about all of the divisions that occurred during COVID in our whole culture, in the church, you know, people like, don't wear a mask. People, you better wear a mask, you know. People, I'm not going to va get vaccinated. People, you need to get vaccinated. You know, so just, just, oh, it was terrible. I don't ever want to live those years again. Because it's like, what happens to love in this? What happens to just do what you feel is right between you and God and leave it at that? And yeah, I know the government got all entangled in it and they, I don't I think they shouldn't have. They overreached. But, you know, the, the bottom line is I got to the point where it's just like, you know what? I'm going to do what I have a, con a good conscience about doing between me and the Lord and I'm going to keep my mouth shut. Because <laughs> it doesn't matter what you say. Somebody's going to be like, oh, I recite, you know? And then, of course, they blast it on social media, you know? It's like, where is the unity of the spirit and the love of God in that? Boy, it's quiet in here. But this is where the rubber meets the road, guys, because we do have differences of opinions, and that's okay. Nobody's trying to change your convictions, sir. It's just that we can't let those things divide the body of Christ. It's just not worth it. And that's the point. Don't destroy the work of God for the sake of food or whatever. Fill in the blank. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for the man who eats with offense. Okay, so again, you're not going to find a more uh, 
just, what's the word? A broader statement than that. All things indeed are pure. Wow. But he says, it's evil for the man who eats with offense. In other words, if my freedom is then bringing an offense to you, it's grieving your heart, then it's wrong. It's wrong for me to exercise that liberty in front of you. In that way, you know, just careless about how you're perceiving this. And that's the fourth principle here is that we need to respect the conscience. I need to respect my conscience. You need to respect your conscience. I need to respect your conscience. You need to respect mine. You see, there is that respect of each other's conscience um, because God has given to us the conscience to help us to discern right from wrong. You know that when you have done something that has violated your conscience. Now, here's the deal. I believe that so many of us in the culture in which we have lived, we become very jaded. And it is easy for us to have violated our conscience so many times that we sear our conscience. That happens. Now, is that, uh, and, and I think our whole culture, I mean, I think about this. What if my grandparents were to turn on primetime television right now. Can you imagine? They would be just like in utter shock of what is happening. And so what happens is we, we tend to get desensitized to what's going on in our culture. And, and, and that's dangerous because it can, it can leave us jaded. And it can leave us to the point where we're no longer sensitive to the promptings of conscience. We need to be sensitive to the promptings of conscience. It is in conscience that the Holy Spirit comes and helps us to discern right from wrong. And now you say, well, what if a person has gotten so hardened in their heart? Is, is that beyond repair? No, it's not. It's not beyond repair. Not under the new covenant. You say, well, how do you know that? Because God said, I will take away their hearts of stone and I will give them a heart of flesh. Yeah. That talks about God tenderizing the conscience and the heart. And we need that. We need to be more sensitive about when the Holy Spirit is saying, ah, don't do that. Now, I don't know about you guys, okay? I'm speaking to guys here, okay? You know that there has been times when you have said like a little remark to your wife. And, you, and you're just like, no big deal, you know? But the Holy Spirit is saying, you just injured your bride. And you look at her and there's just that look. And you know, you know, you know, maybe there's a tear. Maybe there's just not a tear. Maybe just the pans are really loud in the kitchen right now. Uh, and you know, you know. And then you can come back and you can say, you know, and she'll say, well, you mad at me? No, I'm not mad. It's like, maybe it's not the words. Maybe it's the tone, right? But the issue is, are you really listening to God? Are you listening to your wife? Are you letting the Holy Spirit just make you aware of the people around you and how that might be interpreted, you know, whatever it is, a word, an action, a gesture, you know? So, so be sensitive to these things. Be sensitive because God is... He'll speak to you and he'll make you aware. Um, and we don't want to do those things that are going to cause offense to others needlessly. It's good neither to eat meat nor drink wine or do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. He's saying, listen, I know I have liberties here. Paul's saying this, but it's better for me just to deny myself rather than to cause my brother to stumble or to, to offend his conscience, to make him weak, to, to give him a reason, you know, to sin. It's not worth it to me. I will set aside my liberty. I will deny my right in order to love my brother. Amen? Jesus said in Luke 17, it is impossible that no offenses should come but woe to him through whom they do come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea 
than that he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed to yourselves. God wants us to be aware, you know, lest we would in some way offend one of these little ones who's putting their trust in the Lord. Do you have faith? Paul says, have it to yourself before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. So you got faith? You can practice this between you and the Lord? Doesn't bother your conscience? Happy are you. Great. You don't condemn yourself in, in what you're approving. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he does not eat from faith for whatever is not from faith is sin. So if you have doubts about this, if there's that little voice saying, you know, this isn't probably a good idea and you go ahead and ignore it and do it anyway, then you're condemned. Not that you're condemned eternally. He's just saying that you're in the wrong here because you violated your conscience. You know, but if you have faith and, and you partake, great. But, but if you do this and, and you're partaking, you're eating, you're drinking, whatever it is that you're partaking, your indulgence of whatever that is, is not from faith, then whatever is not from faith is sin. Hey, there is a wonderful rule of thumb that applies to so many areas of life. Listen, God will give you the faith for something if he's in it. And, and I can't explain that except I can just tell you there are times when the Lord just gives me the faith to like do this. There are other times when it's more like this isn't the time. You know, should I, should I contact this person? You know, this person's been on my heart, you know, and, and I'll try and there's no response. And, and, and so it's like, well, what, what do I do? Pray for them. Wait. You know? And then one day, just like the Lord will just prompt me, give that person a call, you know? And, 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 and then that's, that is something that is done in faith. And those are the things that God tends to bless, okay? Because you're waiting on him. But the same thing can be true about any matter in your life. You bring it to the Lord in prayer. You say, God, give me wisdom in this. Does he give you the faith to go for it? Then go for it. If he doesn't give you the faith, if you have doubts about it, if you feel checked, as we say in your spirit about it, or like the Holy Spirit is just saying, no, not yet, then follow that voice, you see. If God gives you the faith, great. If he doesn't, then don't go through with it. Maybe there's a movie that, you know, you say, can I watch this, you know, R-rated movie? And it's like, ah, I don't know about that. You know, look at what, look at that. That you have doubts. Don't do it. See? Don't violate your conscience then. Back off. You know what? You'll still survive if you're not the one to see that new movie. Believe me, you will survive. Life goes on. But if you just ignore that and do it, and then you, you do it, and then you come out, and you, you feel dirty, right? You feel icky inside because you violated what you know your conscience is warning you against. That's what he's talking about here. And it applies to so many areas of life where we just need God's help. We need God to give us the faith to either say yes or the faith to say no. Amen? So those four things, to walk in love, to be kingdom-minded, to pursue peace with mutual edification, and to respect the conscience, not only yours, but the other person's as well. These are the ways that we fulfill practically the law of love. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your presence, God. We do just thank you, Lord, that you've given us so many great resources, Lord, in your word in fellowship, in the church, in our conscience, in the Holy Spirit. I pray, Lord, that you would help us, Lord, in these matters that it, it can be not always easy to discern, Lord, what you're, what you're, where you're telling us to draw the line. I pray, Lord, that you would help us in that, Lord. I pray that we would be wise. I pray that we would uh, not have... Uh, any convictions, Lord, that really are not of you, but neither that we would practice liberties that we cannot thank you for. So, Lord, I pray, just go before us, give us wisdom, help us 
to dwell in love with one another. I pray, Lord, just help us to, to be of one heart and one mind. Help us to dwell in mutual peace and edification as a body that people are going to want to be part of because they, they sense the love of God in our midst. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.